Welcome to Never Say Never, your host Samantha Sarah Valley. I came today to church to uh, interview Pastor Joe and I thought that you know it's gonna be great experience a new church have an interview let him tell his story because his story is absolutely amazing and yeah Pastor Joe has a story and I found myself sitting in the sermon and the message just hit hard it hit hard for me and hard for my media director sitting next to me and just so many things were flowing and so many testimonies and were going on and it was just like I had to bow my head so many times and just say thank you God this is you know where you wanted me to be today and I'm grateful and you know the things that he said it's just it's a powerful powerful thing and I'm not gonna get too deep into it because today's not about me it's about Pastor Joe and I want to say welcome to Never Say Never well thank you very much I appreciate it. it's an honor to be here absolutely absolutely um, I want you to tell us a little bit about your upbringing um, sure. and where you're from sure I'm from Tampa Florida um, was born and raised here most of the time um, you know, I grew up in Tampa. My roots are in Tampa. Went to Hillsborough High School, um, and that's about it from yeah. this area. And um, as a as a youth mm -hmm. teenager, was your mindset on I'm going to be a pastor and I'm going to lead a church and I'm going to lead everyone to God? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I, I smile because yeah, um, no, I didn't. I, you know, my my. Uh, whole upbringing was, you know, my grandmother raised me to love the Lord and thank God she did. She was a praying grandmother and she, I, I accredited her prayers for me being here today. But I was, you know, out of control. You know, I was young. I was always going out and partying and doing some crazy things. But no, I never thought I'd ever be a pastor. Never. So, no. Yeah. What, um, what was it that led you to becoming a pastor? Uh, you know, it's it's a really long story. Um, you know, pastors always talk about being called by God. And a lot of people hear that all the time. They don't know what that means. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. You know, um, at one time I got a job at UPS. I was there for 10 years. Um, I was in every aspect of the company. I was bought stock. I was just, you know, trying to build my retirement, basically. doing I bought houses. I was investing in real estate. And uh, there was a guy that I met on my route. He was uh, from Jamaica, and uh, I knew that he was shady. He was doing some things he shouldn't be doing, you know, because every time I deliver packages at his house, he always walk outside, and he's always shifty eye, looking left, right, left. And so, anyways, I dropped off the packages and did, went about my business. Um, one particular day, I went to a restaurant for lunch, and when I was at the restaurant, he walks in. And he walks straight to my table, and I'm like, what does this guy want? He drops $2,000 in my lap and a prepaid cell phone and says, I'll call you soon, and walked out. And I'm like, wow, $2,000 in my lap. I'm going to spend this guy's money. So um, that night, I'm out riding motorcycles with a friend of mine, and we're just, I pull up at a restaurant, and I'm like, the craziest thing happened today. Um, you know, this guy gave me $2,000 and gave me a prepaid cell phone. Well, the phone rang. I walked outside and he said, you know, I want to talk to you about what I've been doing and you know it's probably shady, but I'd really want you to uh, give me a call and, uh, and uh, we'll talk soon. So immediately I was like, I'm not getting involved with this guy, immediately. Um, so I basically told him I wasn't going to do it. Um, that Saturday I went to a place in Brandon, it was a car stereo shop and I pulled up there and, we, and uh, my phone rang again and it was him and he says, hey are you at the car stereo shop in Brandon? Uh, we have a mutual friend. I said yes, so I figured he must know the guy that owns the car stereo shop. So he pulls up in his Mercedes, I get in, he has a box that's been cut open with a razor knife, he shows me how he's packaging his drugs, he explains to me how he's shipping drugs for, through tunnels from Mexico to Arizona. He has UPS stores that he owns and they're shipping the packages to my route. He knows every address on my route. He's followed me everywhere, written down every address that I deliver to every day and said, hey, we can make a lot of money. Why don't we do business? It's pretty simple. I'll call you in the morning. Um, it'll already be shipped and on its way. Uh, you meet me at a gas station. I'll give you a piece of paper with a couple phone number or a couple addresses on it and that'll be it. You get on your truck. You tell me it's a beautiful day. I'll meet you, take the packages, and you get paid. So, you know, I was like, well, let's just do that. You know, I'll try it out for a little bit and see how it is. Well, that became um, everything to me. My paychecks at that time were about $1,000 a week, and I was just depositing the money in the bank. It doesn't sound like a preacher's life at all. Um, I, I was just about to say yeah. that. Like, 
when you look at your preacher, you would never, ever expect yeah. to think, you would think, it's me the God. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Sure. Like your story is going to hit so many people because they're going to know that sure. every everybody has a story. When I tell you, your story is just, living proof testimony yeah. continue continue um you know from there we did business a lot and i started doing business with other people um and uh this you know it's funny i drive down the street and i see these little thugs on the side of the street and they think that they're they're actually thugs but the people i dealt with um would kill your whole family and leave you alive just to deal with their loss and then they would come back and kill you about a week later if you didn't pay them their money that's what the people these kind of people were they ran drugs all throughout the country um, and these are the people I had in my house. These are people I hung out with. They were real. Um, you know, but the Bible says that pride always comes before fall. You know, my, par my praying grandmother uh, had no idea what I was dealing with. My father had no idea what I was doing. I was dating this woman who had a, a, a baby, had a young girl, and I was raising that young girl, and, and money became everything to me. I had everything you could imagine from houses to cars to boats, everything. And uh, that became my life. I stopped going to church. I stopped praying. I just kind of walked away from God, so to speak. So, um, and from there, you know, um, the rest is history. I, you know, I continued to do what I was doing. I'm a friend of mine that I cared about very much that even before I was doing anything illegal, we were friends. So I trusted him. And one day we went out. He had a bunch of money in his pocket. And we kinda, I said, well, how do you have so much money? He says, well, I do things on the side. And I said, well, so do I. And he asked me, like, what do you do on the side? So I told him, and, uh, and uh, he says, well, you should meet some of my friends. So I decided to meet his friends. So now I'm dealing with all kind of people, you know, and now because money is becoming everything to me. And he's like, listen, they ship cocaine. Let's talk to them about, hey, you can make so much more money. And you know what? We met for lunch. We talked about it. I didn't feel comfortable with them at first. I was like, I don't know, and we just went on about our business. Well, come to find out years later, my friend was a paid informant by the feds. Um, unfortunately, you know, well, fortunately, God took my legs out from underneath me. Let me rephrase that because, you know, I shouldn't be here today because I should be dead because of the people I dealt with. And you know what? The feds came one day on my route. I was making deliveries, and six American-made cars pulled in, and they all jumped out, and one guy... The first person that approached me, I said, I'm from the Department of Homeland Security. I said, I'm not a terrorist. What do you want? He, sa <laughs> he said, well, this is DEA, and uh, we know there's drugs on your truck. Well, I knew there wasn't drugs on my truck. So I was like, well, I started kind of being a little bit, I was a little bit mean. I was like, go ahead and find them if you Cocky, can find them. Arrogant. Yeah, I was arrogant, yeah. you know, and <laughs> they found no drugs in the truck whatsoever, and they were all on the phone circling, I guess, on the phone with the prosecutor I found out later. Then they pulled out a picture of the girl that I was raising, six years old. This is the picture of her mother. And they said, do you know that we're going to arrest this woman? We're going to lock her up too because a conspiracy charge is anybody that knows of a crime. And then they pulled out a picture of the one guy I was dealing with. And they said, we know him, we know of him, he's hot, we've been watching him. And then all of a sudden, the guy turns up his radio, and I hear, do, 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 DEA, we're coming in. They kicked in the door, and I heard him in the background. And he said, he's about to tell on you right now. He's going to tell on everybody that you know, and you're going to go to prison. And I, he goes, you work for this guy? And I was like, yeah, we work together. And he goes, you're going to jail. And so from that, that point on, I went to jail. And to be honest with you, never been to jail for anything in my life. Never been in trouble for anything in my life. And here I am. Uh, thinking that that was my lowest point, um, seeing my father at my bond hearing, which they didn't want to give me because they said we had I had a lot of money stashed away, um, scared to death, you know. And I walk in there in shackles, my hands shackled to my waist, and um, the judge granted me grace and gave me bond, and I left. But when I saw my grandmother, that was my lowest point. That was when I hit rock bottom because she raised me to love God. She raised me to love the Lord. And I knew I was going to go to prison. You know, I knew that ultimately the outcome of this situation, because it was a smuggling charge, I was going to go get locked away.